We are back at it again with another episode, and today I have someone on the podcast that I have legitimately, yet again, another person that I have only met once in person, um, but I'm very interested to dive in here and uh, and go deep on some different topics. How are you doing today, Amy? I'm doing so well. It's good to be here. I'm excited. Yeah, I really appreciate you making the time, and I'd like to to start there's there's a lot of things going on in your life there's a lot of things that you stand for there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that that you embody but i want to kind of start with going back to uh to dublin what's mm-hmm. get, pop me an elevator pitch for dublin never been oh wow okay well you're not missing much i mean i i love it but it's different it's very small like i went to school with the same people from preschool to you know graduation so like you you know everybody everybody knows you um gossip is a big part of it, you know, small town politics are different. And, um, yeah, I loved growing up there. I loved leaving a little bit more. When you say politics are different, what, what do you mean? Oh, I mean, it's very Republican. Sorry. Politics are different from me, I guess I should say. Yeah. Very like conservative, super Republican. Um, if you are a little different, they struggle with that. Not everyone it's gotten a lot better, but, um, yeah, typically they want you to be like married pretty young, kids pretty young, you know, in the workforce, mm, that kind of stuff. The traditional Southern way, right? Yes, yes. Married and kids as soon as possible. Absolutely. About grandkids so grandma doesn't feel like she wasted her life and yeah. job <laughs> making mm-hmm. everyone happy, huh? Yeah. And I love it. I mean, I, I love going back and my nephews have a great life. You know, they, they grow up, they, my parents live in front of the river. They live in front of the river. They're fishing. They're in the boat. They're like riding four wheelers and stuff, but I wanted something a little bit different. And, uh, so I moved to Atlanta when I was 17, like fresh out of high school. And now I enjoy visiting home, but I don't, I don't want to end up, end up back there. How often do you visit? You know, I used to visit a lot because I, I needed to, um, I had like, I needed to fire stuff. So I'm a ceramic artist and my kiln was in Dublin, but it's about two hours from here. So I was going like once a week for a very long time. And now that I don't have to do that anymore, I don't get back as often as I should probably like every couple months. And your kiln was down there. You you, you were already doing ceramics before you left. Um, no. So I, well, it's it's a long story, but I had, I was gifted a kiln. Yeah, that's true. Um, a company sent me a kiln to be able to do work with because I lost my, um, access to the kiln that I had and I didn't have anywhere to put it. Like I was working out of our apartment and I couldn't, I would have like voided the lease immediately. So I put it in my parents' pool house, which was fine, you know, but I was truly like working, you know, 50 hours and then driving home and loading the kiln. And that takes like a a huge amount of time. It's going to fire for 24 hours. I'd have to unload, like repack it. Like it was just way, way too much. So it lived there until I got a studio space that could support the like electrical side of, of having a kiln. Okay. Let's back up. Let's back up. So please eight years old, right? Mm -hmm. You started taking art seriously back at eight, but Mm -hmm. why so young? Um, I, I don't know. I just was always like a, like crafty kid. Like I was always drawing. I was always painting. I had a great aunt that was like a oil painter. And so I always saw that it was an option. And when you're in a small town, like you either do like sports or you do like art stuff. And I'd done the sports and I, I couldn't handle the like pressure of it all. Uh, and so I just started taking art lessons because it was like something to do like for in the early or like late 90s it was it was a popular thing in Dublin f- to like try out the oil painting class like that's where I started so that's how I ended up there but I really loved it and st- like did it until I graduated and moved away like weekly lessons with this one woman doing oil painting mm-hmm. how'd you get away from the oil painting though um in money time like I went with where the money was. Oil painting is like gorgeous. It is so special, but it takes so, so much time. And like, even for the paint to dry, it can sometimes take up to a week. Goodness. So you enjoyed the, the action of it, but the monetization of it is. Yeah. It's just not feasible. Like I can't bust out, you know, I can sit here if I want to today and I can 
finish 25 mugs. Like it will be hard and I will be working for a while, but I could finish them and then sell them. I couldn't sit down and one day and finish 25 paintings. Fair enough. Fair enough. So you were doing, you were doing oil painting, right? Until Mm -hmm. you, you left Mm -hmm. uh, Dublin, good old Dublin. Uh, Mm -hmm. Had you started ceramics at that point at all? Had you even dipped your toe in? I had done it a little bit, um, but Dublin didn't have the like funding, the access, like none of that stuff. So I studied, I went, I went into college and was just going to be a painter. I was like, that was my whole thing. I was going to do oil painting and that was going to be, I was going to be like the next big thing. But I realized that was incredibly difficult. And like, I, how was I going to really make money with that? So I switched gears to something way safer, which was just a teaching degree. And when you get a teaching degree in art school, you have to learn all of the, um, different like art mediums basically. So that was my first like genuine ceramics class was in college. And that was at uh, Georgia state. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I guess knowing what you know now, where you're at doing, doing art full time. No, mm-hmm. yeah. no other, no other side gig. No, other... no, nah, babe, this is it. Okay. Okay. We love to hear it. We love to hear <laughs> it. Not a starving artist. She's out here. No. Um, what do you think is the value of like, let's say you had already known that you want to do ceramics. Mm-hmm. What do you think the value of getting a, an education in, in a, for a bachelor's of fine arts or in printmaking or in X, Y, Z thing? Like, what do you think the value of that is for someone that's going to not go into education? Right. And I know that you've kind of, you kind of have a, a, a split in the road where you're doing multiple things now, but for someone that never goes into education, that just wants to be an artist, like, what do you think the value of a, of a college degree for that is? Yeah. You know, this is something I think about all the time, especially every time I get an email that's like student loans, it's time to pay those. And it's tough because I loved my college experience because of the opportunities it gave me and the people that I met, but I am in no way, everything I learned that is making me money right now in my current full-time art position, I learned on the job or on independent research or like somewhere else. I didn't learn it in college. So it's tough because I think that if you are unsure of where you want to go, there is value in going to college and like dipping your toe in a bunch of different things. But if you know, like you said, printmaking, for instance, if you know that that's what you want to do, I think there's more value in than like getting an apprenticeship somewhere and finding someone that will teach you and and put in the legwork and like earning your spot there. Yeah, I, th- I think the same could probably be said for for marketing and advertising, mm-hmm. right? Because a lot of things that you're learning in school are things that are from 10, 15 years totally. ago that they had textbooks printed on. So uh, I would say that, you know, coveted is probably a, another, hey, just get up under somebody that's doing it at a high level, get yeah. very transactional with it and, and kind of see where you're going. Were you already selling art before you went to college? No, not like now. No, I was, if I was selling anything, it, it was older paintings. Um no, I didn't start selling my own work until like 2019. Okay. So graduated in 2012. Yeah, that sounds right. From, from Georgia Something State. Like that. And then yeah. started selling your art in 2019. What the hell did you do for the seven <clears throat> years? Yeah, I worked at a ceramic studio in Atlanta. I started as just like a studio assistant. And when I graduated college, I obviously had this teaching degree that I had like, you know, they make you teach. Like I I had like boots on the ground experience. So my bosses at that studio, they were like, we know you don't want to actually teach, which was very manipulative at the time because I was like 22 and I didn't know, you know, I had no idea. And they were like, what if you just stay here and you create like a classes program for us? So I, from the ground up, built like an adult art program at this studio and a kid's art program at the studio. Then I started teaching them all. Then I started, um, training on that. And I got like very high up in the company. And in 2019, it was like a very toxic workplace environment, which is like not a word I throw around lightly. Like it was not good. Um, they called me in for a meeting. I thought we were going to discuss, uh, the upcoming like Christmas, you know, plans. And they laid me off. They said my position was no longer required and I didn't have a job anymore. So I, like lost my entire identity. Cause that my, that job was my whole thing. Like I gave them so much time, like so much of my life. Um, so I like had a full meltdown. Can I cuss on this? Yeah. You can say whatever the <laughs> okay, fuck I had you a want. Full anytime. fucking meltdown. Um, and 
like I was still really well known within my industry, like within the ceramics industry, and I didn't want to disappear. So I made it work for me. But yeah, I didn't start selling my own stuff until um, I had to basically. And some of, some of that was because I, I never needed to, like I had a full-time job. And the other end of that was that my bosses were like very weird about me trying to like make a name for myself without them. When you say toxic and, and we don't need to, we don't need to give them any more, you know, <laughs> any actual publicity that they don't deserve here. Right. So we, we don't need to use their name. However, I am curious when you say toxic, can you, can you kind of go into that? Cause I, a lot of people nowadays say, Hey, their workplace is toxic. Mm-hmm. Hey, you know, this is toxic. Hey, that is toxic. And I don't think that you throw that a word, that word around from the interactions I've seen you have with tons of people online. Like you're very intentional with what you say. Yeah. How do you mean by toxic? Uh, well, I can give you some examples. Like I, uh, so the industry I'm in is called paint your own pottery. So P Y O P. And it's like, a um, independently owned studios, people can come in off the street. They can grab a fired mug and they can paint out however they want. So that's, that's what I had been doing for a long time. I'd gotten really well known in the industry and we have industry conferences. So I was going to these conferences and teaching and people like loved to hear from me. And I would come back from these conferences, like on a high being like, wow, I must know what I'm talking about because I wasn't being told that in my regular job. And they were always just shutting me down, like saying like, you know, we can't send her to another one because her head's going to get too big. She'll never be able to fit through the door, stuff like that. And then on the other end of things, I once requested two weeks off the day after Christmas for uh, my girlfriend's family took us to Ireland. It was incredible. Um, I requested that time off in June and they ha- they like lost their minds about it. So I gave them six months notice to be two weeks off after our busiest time of the year. And they were, they, my boss specifically said, you make me want to stick a pin in my eye. Like that's how frustrated she was that I was going to ask for time off. I worked every major holiday. I couldn't take the time off. They were incredibly invasive in my personal life. And I was too young to know that I could choose not to answer them. You know, I, they didn't, I didn't owe them anything. Um, I, today, actually, I was just thinking about how one time they like asked me to internet bully another local business because they were, this local business had like taken some photos from our website and, and like wanted to use it on their Facebook pages, pages, inspiration. And so they asked me literally to internet bully them. And I had to, I remember being scared to say no. And that's like the hold that they had on me. So I getting laid off from there was like truly the best thing that happened to me because it was like Stockholm syndrome. Like I needed to leave, but I didn't know how, and I felt like I couldn't. And it, it was just, it was a really rough time. So that was like uh, almost a decade there. I was there. I was there from 2010 to 2019. So you got in there before you graduated from state? Yeah. Was that a, a company that was affiliated with the program that you were going through or? No, no. I... They're just like an indie shop. Okay. So you get in there and, and I, I would have to guess, right. And this is a massive assumption that, sure. um, the studio, you going in there, right? They're preaching family, they're preaching team, they're preaching inclusivity, they're preaching all of these things that you would want out of something that is not the norm or not mm-hmm. mainstream, like a kind of a cool work environment where like maybe we pop beers at in, in the middle of the day, maybe we go and get <laughs> espresso, you know, and like people are cool with that. But was it that at all? It was less like less pop beers in the middle of the day and more like we don't care what you're about and who you want to be with and what you look like as long as you can show up and like, you know, be good at what you're doing. And so I, I, we, there were three studios around the Atlanta area, one in Atlanta, one in Marietta, one in Alpharetta. I was going to all three of them to work and like people loved me. Like they loved that. I looked a little different. They love that. I have tattoos. I love that. I have piercings. It like added to the artsy part of it, you know, but yeah, it, it certainly wasn't like fun all the time, but they, I think they aspired to to be that. They just didn't quite nail it. Interesting. So how did you get lured in there? I needed a job when I was in college and they were, when I first moved to Atlanta, it was very big. You know, I'm coming from a really small town and there were only certain neighborhoods that I would go to. And I just happened to drive by this place one day and like had gone in on my own and like brought mm-hmm. some friends and one day when I went in, they were hiring and I was like, oh, well, let's try it. I'd worked in restaurants and I just was like, d- could like, just was not cut out for the restaurant life at, in my early twenties. I was like way too anxious and like, 
you know, can't, I just couldn't do it. So this was more my speed and they taught me everything. They taught me like kiln work. They taught me like glaze stuff. I mean, I, I owe them a lot of, you know, where I'm at today in terms of the like knowledge of it all, because I, I had time to play and time to learn. And, you know, they didn't necessarily foster that, but they didn't tell me to stop. When you say that you owe them something, um, or you owe mm-hmm. them where you're at, uh, I mean, are you talking about compensation you owe them or gratitude you owe them or? I think more, certainly not compensation. My God, they owe me a lot. Um, I, gratitude. I mean, it was, it was terrible. It was a, I worked so much and like truly missed. There were times where I would drive down to Dublin for on Christmas Eve and have to come back Christmas midway through Christmas day, because I had a meeting the next day for a pottery shop. Like it just didn't make any sense. So I certainly don't owe them like, you know, a lot, but I do want to acknowledge that I wouldn't necessarily be where I'm at here without that stepping stone. Would you say the biggest benefit was the technical know-how and the understanding and then also the the podium that it gave you to speak to other people in industry? Yeah, I mean, the access to the stuff, I would have never had access to a kiln. Like I would have never had access to like glass and being learned how to being able to learn how to do glass work and um, even like meet people that own these companies that I now contract with, you know, I would have, it would just would not have happened because I didn't know this industry existed. I mean, even a lot of people don't know this industry exists. Like my parents don't fully understand what I do. Like I, I'm leaving this weekend to go teach at a convention for this industry. And my parents are like, what are you doing again? Like, it's a confusing, weird thing. If you just don't know that it exists. Yeah. If, if you, if you had to go back and do it again, let's say you still went through all of that right there for almost, what is it? I mean, basically 10 years, Mm -hmm. right. From 2010 to 2019. Um, if you could do that without the BFA, Mm -hmm. would you drop the BFA? Mm, Probably not. No, I don't think so. Only because I I guess I, I don't, I think about it less in terms of like, there's this thing that I need. And I think about it more of like who I was then I needed that college experience to like know how to exist in the world. Like I, if I would have gone straight from small town into like this work, this like corporate environment, it would not have, I I would have not done a good job. So I needed the time that the BFA afforded me. And it, is that time, like when you say time, the time to be out in a different culture, the time to be around different people, the time to figure out yeah. who you, you feel yeah, the, you the time and the space to like get it wrong. It, it, the stakes are so much lower when you're in college and get something wrong than when you're, you know, supposed to be an adult and like making money, someone's paying you every month. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you said that uh, they really threw the book at you when you, uh, when you tried to put in for the vacation with mm-hmm. Elaine, mm-hmm. Elaine right? yep. and, and her family. Mm-hmm. So they, they try to throw the book at you for that. I guess I'm curious where, where does Elaine come into this? What, was she in Dublin? Was, was she <laughs> in BFA? Was she someone that you saw in another, another shop and you're like, nah, I'm pretty cute. No, she worked at the pottery shop. She oh, wow. showed up about 2012, I want to say. So I'd already been there a couple of years and I was like upper management um, and she was like coming in, you know, fresh faced, like in college. Modernization. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we did a lot of kissing in supply closets and for that, I'm grateful for the job. I mean, I would have never met her without mm-hmm. it. So some good does come from bad. Yeah, no, that that's interesting. Um, so, I mean, while, while you were there, right, for the next seven years, mm-hmm. right, you, I'm sure you didn't start kissing her day one. That would be mm-hmm. a little... Oh, oh no no not day one <laughs> like um, day seven no no, no. okay okay so y'all, y'all did seven seven years there together <laughs> did she stay while you were there the whole time no she left much sooner than I did because also it's incredibly difficult to be dating someone that works at the place that you are you know where your upper management like it just got too complicated and again like the job was shitty so she was like no I'm out of here this place sucks and um she left probably like 2014 or something Okay. And, and from her to, to family, 
to people in your life now, would you say that you have a solid support system for what you do? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, Elaine is incredible at that kind of stuff. Like she's, I work alone. Like I don't see anyone. I don't bounce ideas off of anyone. I, it can get incredibly lonely, especially coming from a place where I had a team and I, you know, I am the team now. So Elaine is really good at like being able to help me like parse something out or, you know, even just be like, I, you've been working really hard. Like, how can I support you in that way? My parents are great. They don't understand exactly what's happening. Um, but friends are great. Elaine's great. Like I'm okay. I've done a lot of this alone and I guess I have learned that, you know, I of course need people, but I'm not like, I can do it. You know, <laughs> I know I can do it. How much of that do you think is, is fear of, of running the team yourself? Um, it's not that it's because I, I had an employee last year and it just did not work out. Um, that's a different story, but I would love to run a team. I, it's just hard to find someone that can come into a already established place, an already established brand of one person and get them to care as much as I care. It's hard. I mean, I would love to have it. I'd love to have even one other person in here to like help me go to the next level. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm just waiting for that right person to come along. Yeah. I'd like to push back on you a little bit there. Please. That, that an employee would come in and ever care as much as you did. Yeah, do, no, do they won't. That that's, do you think that that's even something that you would desire for someone? Because isn't that perhaps the same place that you were at with the last place that you were at that was toxic? Well, <laughs> the toxicity from the last place came from like a lack of support or like mm -hmm. a lack of... um belief that I could do something as good as they could do. So when I want someone in here with me to care as much as I do, I mean, care in terms of like, we make a quality product and we have incredible customer service and our space is clean. Like that's what I'm looking for. And it's difficult, you know, I, I think that's difficult to find, but to ask me again what you just said because I think I lost the plot a little bit. I, I was I was just more speaking to the point that I have too been in the same position where I'm like, damn, I really wish that I could just find an employee that cared about the business and the direction yeah. that we're going as much as <laughs> I did. Not that I expect to work that much, totally. But you know, for me, it, it and I've I've had failed employees as well, right? And contractors that have worked with me that some have succeeded. I've succeeded in in cultivating relationships. Mm -hmm. Some like they gone by the wayside. No harm, no foul, right? It totally. is what it is. But, you know, I was just curious if, you know, somebody that actually cared to the level that you did, wouldn't they be also susceptible and not saying that you would be in a position to be toxic, but wouldn't they also have to be susceptible to that level of toxicity to just follow you blindly and care as much? Totally. But I, and I, like you said, like I, last year with my failed employee, like mm -hmm. it was a joint effort. Like it mm -hmm. takes two to fail, you know? And so I certainly have learned a lot from that experience. So I don't, when I say I want someone to really care, I just want someone that can communicate, you know, that can, because I'm not looking for someone to be in here 50 hours a week with me. I want someone in here like 20 hours a week with me and we do excellent concentrated work. So yeah, I mean, I'm sure there is a reason why I haven't hired again. And it is because I am not ready in this current moment. You know, I want to be ready by June, but I'd, I'm not ready right now. So yeah, sure. There for sure is some fear there. And I'm sure there's plenty of toxicity there. I want like a partner and I, and I don't know if maybe I have a business that can afford me a partner. Maybe I, I don't get that, you know, never say never. But I guess, I guess, uh, you know, time will, time will tell yeah. where, where do you think, where do you think you failed most though? And like on the, on the character side or on the execution side with, with the employee that you would need to bolster before you brought on somebody else. I certainly failed in like <clears throat> follow through of some aspects. Like, you know, again, I've been working alone for so long that they would come in my old employee and. I would say, okay, this is what, you know, you're going to work on today. This is how you do it. Do you have any questions? And they'd say no. 
And then I would get so head down in what I was doing that I'd look up and half an hour later, they had done something completely not what I had said. And I had not realized that I needed to look up and be like, are you actually good? Because I realized that a lot of people, I'm not this way, but a lot of people, if they have a question, they won't ask it. And so that I had to learn to like re-communicate with someone. And even though I felt like I was making an environment that was like super open and like, you can, we can talk about whatever you can ask me, whatever, like there is literally no stupid question. Like my name is on the line. I want you to do it right. If you need to ask me something stupid, I will not hold it against you. They just weren't doing that. Um, and then it got to a point where I was like asking for things to be done and they weren't getting done and there was no communication. And, and I just, I really shut down and I was not able to be like, right now you've made the mistake that we need to, and we need to fix it. I had to like walk away a lot of times to like regroup because just like in a relationship, like you don't want to say something you don't mean, or you don't want to say something from a place of like your hurt, angry self. Mm -hmm. So I would walk away and I would leave it like a little bit too long. So something that I need to learn, like in my workplace and even like in my personal relationship, like I have to learn how in the moment to completely unemotionally be like, that actually isn't what I said. And like, let's just take a second to regroup and refigure it out. So like, you know, strategies, policies, like a lot of things like that have to be so, so tight mm -hmm. before you bring someone on. And it wasn't tight when I brought this employee on. I resonate with that probably more than I think you even know, because <laughs> I brought on someone to do what we call lead nurture, right? Which is essentially just like setting, I don't know how much appointment setting you do for any of the kind of pop-ups or anything or any of the teaching mm -hmm. that you do. Uh, so if something doesn't make sense, please say something, but um, do a lot of consultations and the consultations, obviously we got to get someone there, right? Mm -hmm. On Zoom or in person or what have really? you. And a lot of times, I mean, the money is made on our end by making sure that the people that have given us their attention get taken care of all the way up to the appointment time where then we can see if we could be a good fit. Totally. Right? The problem that I had is, is about the same. I thought my SOPs were, were tight and I realized, I thought they were tight. I thought everything was wound down and someone could just jump in and go. And mm -hmm. I realized that there was way more in my head than what I was yes. putting in my Loom videos. There's way more yes. in my head than what I was putting on paper. And when stuff would happen, I'm like, oh, that's easy. It's just this. Some other SOP was taken just mm -hmm. on their own liberty. And then we were just, we were just burning 50 to hundred dollars a day on ads plus paying them. Mm -hmm. and, and go in the wrong direction. So I know how that feels and it's super frustrating and you want to just, can you just do it right? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, a lot of people don't learn this way, you know, they have to see it right mm -hmm. written down or they have to yeah. have a list or things like that. And so it's, it is difficult and time consuming and training. I mean, at my old job, I trained and trained and trained and it's so expensive to train someone. And even like, just before I bring someone on now, again, I have to completely rewrite my employee handbook from even last year because things are different. Like things are constantly changing and that can feel really overwhelming, uh, you know, if you're the one doing it all. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that, <laughs> that, um, that makes sense. I've been in the exact same position. I I'm curious, would you say that traditionally educated, and this is a complete left turn, but traditionally educated artists, right. in stroke direction in um in what I what I would call and I had a, a studio art minor there for a minute so Yay. I'm not up on my up on my jargon here but what I would what I would consider would be like traditional means of like how to do line drawings how to do uh like brush stroke on things how to um formulate goodness any any kind of like brazing and like the traditional methods of teaching around those things would you say that an artist that's traditionally taught or an artist that is self-taught is able to implement more creativity on the business front okay let me think about that that's a good question you know i think picasso says like you have to learn the rules before you can break them I think there is value in both in this like classically trained and trying to figure it out on your own kind of thing. Um, I feel like, ugh, I don't know. I don't know. What do you think? Tell me what you think. I, I think that some of the people, I, I think that there's, I'll use, do you know who Jai Wolf is? I don't think so. Okay. Um, 
he is a um he's an artist that's that's uh that's in music right but is very non-conventional right mm -hmm. all of his keys solid all mm -hmm. the pitches solid there's nothing that sounds out of place but his construction is is crunchy that's how i would mm -hmm. describe it crunchy because it doesn't follow melodic patterns or or traditional music where you have you know You've got a verse, you've got a chorus, you've got a buildup, you've got a crescendo, a decrescendo, you've got a peak, you've got three of them, like what have you. I'm I'm not trained in traditional music, if you can't tell. So, um, sounds like but, it. But um, he doesn't follow typical structure and mm -hmm. legitimately just picked up a MIDI pad, right? So just a pad with stuff and program sounds into it and started making music that way. And it's very fascinating to me to see someone like that who is not at the level of, let's say, uh, ludicrous or ACDC and and we're going to go like all genres, anyone on like that, that level that is worldwide, mm -hmm. um, but is somebody that has like a very interesting, has very interesting energy in the music. And I enjoy listening to it because yeah. it's different. It's like a, a nice pattern interrupt, but I think it's, it's also something that he's not traditionally trained. A lot of these other people worked up under apprenticeships on Def Jam records and various, various places producing and, and making and it seems to be interesting that very few people from the the non-traditional side mm -hmm. make it to stardom, if you want to, like at the, the peak peak of industry. But a lot of them seem to be, and again, through the, the looking glass that is social <laughs> media, they seem to be happier. They seem to be less tabloidy. They seem to be living their life mm -hmm. and not just going with the wind that Hollywood says that they need to. Yeah. They don't seem to be as big. I have, I have, uh, I have respect for both sides sure. right there, but I don't know which one is better. I think you, in my mind, like I'm thinking about it in terms of, I'm always thinking in like business, like, how are we going to make money? How, mm -hmm. how are we going to market this? I think they, those two people that we're talking about can learn from each other. And so there's benefits and, you know, because this person who is not traditionally trained and is making stuff like on these little pads that you're talking about, like when it comes time to go bigger he'll have the people that are traditionally trained mm -hmm. and hopefully they can have a conversation i mean for me like i want to hear from everybody i want to mm -hmm. hear i want to learn from someone who has no idea what they're doing or you know in terms of like you know what i mean Technical and then i want to right and then i want to learn from someone who you know has been learning and teaching and growing forever and ever like i think that there's it like that disruption of thought is very important <laughs> I mean, even for me, like I don't do anything like if some ceramicists, like th when they look at how I glaze things, they're like, that's not right. You're not supposed to do that, but it's because it's not what they were taught, but it works for me and that's my style. And that's what I'm recognized for. So I'm going to keep doing it. You know, it's like within the boundaries of ceramics, like it's fine. It's just not what is typical. Yeah. How, how do you differ from, from them and in format because I don't know anything about ceramics. No, that's fine. Educate. I <laughs> that's fine. So we're I'm gonna try not to get too boring, but I work from Biscware. So I design shapes and they are manufactured and sent to me. So I don't have to throw anything, I don't have to pour anything. Um just from a money standpoint, if I if I hand built or threw the mug that I am doing decorative work on, that's going to be like a $300 mug because right. We're paying ourselves hourly. A lot of time goes into that. Um, I'm not starting there. So this stuff comes to me um, pre bisked, which means it's been fired once. Um, it's all my designs. I'm just Stupid not question. having to Can I please, you? please. Is that, is that without the outer covering without the color? That's just like just the pottery, like the, the color of what raw pottery looks like. Wow. So this is it. So Why is it's it hard. Uh, this is what the clay body is. So the clay body mm -hmm. could be black. It could be speckly. It could be like off white, but this is a, just the white clay body that, that my manufacturing okay. uses. Um, it comes to me, this is ready to be glazed. So then I get to glaze it. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, still making that noise. Um, and then it goes into the kiln and is fired. So this is a piece like my watermark is on the bottom. You can't see it, but like, this is a piece that I designed that they made a mold for me and now they mass produce it. Um, and then I get to get it. Okay. And is glaze that a it. lip on, on the, the side closest to the camera? A lip right here. Yeah. 
is a little nose. <laughs> I like it. I like I it. I know. I The one that's fire is way over there. But um, yeah, so I, so when I'm glazing, when I'm glazing, for instance, like you can't really see here, you can see if you like look on my internet and stuff, but I glaze really heavily. And like mm-hmm. a lot of traditional potters, people that are throwing stuff or building stuff, they are dip glazing because again, they're keeping their costs down. If they were to sit and paint all of the stuff themselves, that's a $200 mug, a $300 Holy mug. So shit. Okay. So but you're, the way you're designing and they're, they're like dipping into a color or a multitude yes. of colors sitting in wa- a solution. That yes, is like exactly. Getting scooped and yes. you're by hand. And we yeah, I'm doing everything by hand. Painting? Is it? Yeah, gla- we are painting with ceramic glazes. So okay. typically people are, this is like the glaze stage, mm-hmm. but painting for sure. And so I'm, I do like textured painting. Like I like to paint for texture. So I'm using like a lot in a small area so mm-hmm. that when it's fired, you can feel the texture of it. And so someone that is dip glazing or someone that is, you know, <laughs> has a different like end game than me. They look at that and they think like, I don't, I didn't think you were able to do that. Or I didn't think you were supposed mm-hmm. to do that kind of thing. I get a lot of, I get really self-conscious about um, the way that I work. This is me just telling you feelings for no reason you did not ask, but vomit, go, 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 go. So because I don't hand build this stuff mm-hmm. because I'm designing it and it's getting manufactured for me, there have been traditional potters that like, frown upon what I do um, because I'm doing more surface design uh, versus like building it. You know what I mean? So I do get really self-conscious about like my work Mm -hmm. (laughs) in terms of like a traditional standpoint, like it is not traditional and it makes me feel, it just makes me feel weird. And I don't, I don't ever talk about that because I don't want to feel weird. And there are artists that like use canvas that they buy from the store and they're still artists. So that, that is just like a insecurity that I have dealt with from like literally just like two people saying something to me years ago that I have not been able to let go of. Isn't that so silly? Is it silly or is it that you have potential shame because it's not in the light because you don't talk about it? I mean, I don't want to talk about it. I'm, I'm annoyed that I even just brought it up here with you, to be honest with you. Um, it but, it just but feels Amy, why 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 annoyed? It's part it's part <laughs> oh, of... because I don't want to show that to literally anyone. <laughs> okay, but I mean, is is perhaps being a little bit more vulnerable that you struggle too on the art side, where many people think that you're, um, you're, I mean, you're you're somebody that they they aspire to be that is like, hey, this yeah. perfect artist that's doing her own thing, that's you know forging a new path. I mean, do people get to always see the the real side too? And the vulnerability there because I know you show it on the personal side you're very open yeah the and you post there for sure yeah no I mean it's it's the reason why I don't share it is it because it comes with so much background information like had I not just spent the last 10 minutes explaining this to you you might not have understood what I was talking about so I just don't get into it do you know what I mean like I it's just it's not worth me giving it light because what does it end with? It ends with like strangers or like friends on the internet being like, no, 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 no. Like that's not real. And it's like, well, it can be real. And I, you know, and you don't have to validate every single move that I make. Like it can just still be mine, you know, and I can, that's something that I am will keep and will have um, because it's not affecting me at the end of the day. Like I'm still making money. I'm still selling out in 30 seconds. I'm still crushing it, you know, but yeah. it, it's funny that, I'm sure in some aspects of what you do, either personally or in fitness or in business, like there are little things that you are, you know, that are kind of speaking in your ear, like, no, but wait, because it's imposter syndrome at the end of the day. It's like, let me find one thing to, to disrupt this like good feeling. You know what I mean? That's what, that's what I'm doing there. Yeah. And that's fair enough. I appreciate you going, you, you going through that. I mean, you know, uh, an example in the in the let, let's say the gym owner world, right, is using someone else's programming, like legally, mm. like paying for it, licensing mm-hmm. it, okay, mm-hmm. like not doing anything shady. But other people, the only judgment that is cast is from other people in the industry, like, totally. oh, dude, you don't write your own stuff, you don't do this, that, and the other. And where we're at online, because I'm not in the gym setting anymore, we don't use someone else's programming, mm-hmm. right, for for clients. But when I was at CrossFit Brookhaven, I, you bet your ass, I'm not spending all the time doing that. You pay me yeah. as an employee here, but, and right, and that's what it's for. Like at the end of the day, <clears throat> there are only so many 
credible exercises or, you know what I mean? Like there are only so many safe exercises. So of course you're going to reuse it. And, and, you know, that's a whole other conversation, but it's tough. Like the, the internet of it all can make things really complicated. I think of like, people are quick to make judgments when they're not necessarily in, in it with you. And, and, and I think if they were in your shoes, they'd make the same choices you were making because you're right there. You were an employee. That's what you have other stuff to do. You can't write a training program every day. Yeah. And, and I'm not going to spend that kind of time for the amount of money that I was getting paid being totally. in the position that was supposed to just set me up for the next one. Right. That I was like, totally. I'm going to give my best here, but like, I'm not spending 40 hours a week writing programming when I can tell you that every single CrossFit games champion came out of a specific gym and they're writing the programming that we're using. Then I can mm-hmm. scale from there. I have the mm-hmm. knowledge to be able to, you know, move up and down, regress and progress. But <clears throat> I see not a damn thing wrong with what you're doing at all. Yeah. And it, well, and it makes me accessible. You know what I mean? Like from a financial standpoint, like I don't ever want to, ha- I want to make the money that I, um, that I should, you know, I want to pay myself. I want to get in what I'm getting out, but I don't ever want to have to sell someone something that's hundreds of dollars because of the time that I put into it. You know what I mean? Like that's not fun for anybody. And this shit breaks. Like it's mm-hmm. pottery. Like I do people know that I'm pretty sure, but it's like, can you imagine if you pay $300 for a platter and it broke? That sucks. I could imagine a world in which Amy did sell higher ticket <laughs> items for people that had money and wanted to spend it though. Oh, sure. I mean, yeah, of course, but you know, there's different, there's different Amy's around that Amy's great. She's, she's also doing great, but you know, she's, she's trying to, she's trying to like appeal to a wider range of people because I, I know like I want to own things from people that I admire and sometimes I get priced out. So I want to have a range of stuff for sure. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Does that Amy still exist? Oh, for sure. There's so many Amy's. Are you kidding me? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) There's done. What, um, I mean, outside of, so rainbow mugs, right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is, is that, is that just what you call your, your whole mug program now? Or is that kind of, is that the, the specific that you're doing? That's a specific type of design that you're doing for drops. Yeah. I thought I had one over here. Yeah. I, um, the rainbow mug is like how I got quote unquote, like internet famous. Um, it's still my, (laughs) okay. So when I got laid off, Amy, I haven't been here long. I gotta, I gotta get all the deeds and we gotta gotta get the whole story now. You're right. You're right. So when I got laid off in 2019, I got laid off in August and I was like, fuck, I, I, it was just scary, but I had built this brand. Like I'd worked really hard. Um, and I wanted to try it. So my first like natural next thought is like, okay, Christmas is coming. Like, let me get into a Christmas market. So I applied to a Christmas market and I got it and it was so hard. (laughs) Like I'm not built for that. Like I could do it. I don't want to do it. So that's different. But, um, I was painting all this Christmas stuff, Christmas, Christmas, Christmas. And I was like over it. And so, I decided when I sat down, you know, to, to work on stuff, I was like, okay, today I'm going to paint something that I want. I'm going to paint something where I'm not thinking about an end customer in mind. I'm not thinking about Christmas. I'm not thinking about anything. So I took a mug and I painted a rainbow on it and it was just like, that was it. And I was like, oh, it's fun, you know, whatever. And it sold immediately at the market. And this thing happens around Christmas for a lot of makers where we like kill ourselves getting all this stuff done. And then Christmas happens and we are too tired to like do anything. So if you watch like any small business or makers on the internet come Christmas time, like they will be very quiet from like mid December to probably like mid January. And so I was in that slump where I was like, I'm too tired to do any new work. Like, I don't know what's next. I posted a picture of this rainbow mug that I had already sold on my Instagram. And everybody was like, can I, I want to buy that. And I was like, oh, I didn't even think about that because for a really long time, I used my Instagram as a portfolio only. Like it was me working at that pay your own pottery studio and teaching classes and making all these things. And I needed somewhere to put the pictures of everything because I was proud of it, but I also didn't want to put it on my personal Instagram. So this page was just a portfolio. And when people started being like, oh, I want to buy that. I was like, oh, I didn't even think about that. So I opened like pre-orders and um, people were telling me like what colors they wanted. And, um, I took like two or three orders, like two batches of orders 
in the beginning, which was like maybe 15 mugs. And then all of a sudden they just blew up. Like, I don't know. I don't know what happened. Like it it is like a little bit of a blur where, I mean, I'm good at showing what I'm doing on the internet. Like I, I tell people all the time, like, I feel like I'm the last person having fun on Instagram. And so I like was showing what was happening and, you know, walking you through the process. And then also the pandemic hit, everyone was stuck at home. I worked so hard in 2020. Like I didn't have any time off. Everyone's like, I did all this stuff during the pandemic. I watched all these things. And like, I did not, I was working so hard because these rainbow mugs blew up. And so I was painting, um, so many, like I would release like 40 at a time. And so for in the early stages, I was having to keep track of all these mugs. And I realized that I needed to start putting their names on the bottom of the mug just to make sure I didn't send the wrong one to the wrong person. And I happened to have like nice lettering. And so that accidentally turned into a thing where I was like, oh my God, your name's on the bottom. Like that made the value up a little bit. Anyway. Personalization. It'll Personalization. Do it. They're picking colors. They're putting what they want on the bottom. Yeah. It just blew up. I, I literally had to make a website because I needed to process these rainbow mug orders. And so my website launched in like March, 2020. And I started taking orders that people would regularly break my website. Like I, I would put up 30 and for some reason with my WordPress website, like so many people were trying to check out at the exact same time that it like for a split second, the website would stall and it would let in all of those orders so though I was just putting up 30, it was taking like 70. So I was, I mean, this year in a couple months, I will hit my thousandth rainbow mug and they just started in 2020. So they have a mind of their own <laughs> um, or a following of their own. Like it's what people want from me and I love it. And it has given me um, a lot of what I have now. <clears throat> I also burnt out on it really hard and it it's just interesting because I like I love them don't get me wrong I have to take breaks from them I love them but it sets me up to be nervous that like nothing else will work that good so then I have to like everything that I'm working on so it, it's hard for me to do like regular shop updates with ready to ship pottery ready to ship pieces of my work because I'm like well fuck what if they don't do as well as these rainbow mugs. So it's this idea of like, do I make guaranteed money with these rainbow mugs or do I try something new and push myself and just hope people like it? It's, it's hard. It's weird. It's like, ser- like currently what I'm going through because I'm planning like a May shop update with ready to ship stuff. And what if nobody likes it? Or what it's if weird. everybody likes it? Yeah. I mean, I'm sure they will. Like it, it, that is like a full glimpse. These are the two Amy's, right? These are the, this is the Amy that sells out in 30 seconds and people like send me videos of themselves crying because they didn't get a rainbow mug asking f- for me to make an exception, which is insane by the way. And then there's this one who's like, can't accept that she's successful <laughs> and like will self-sabotage in a way. Um, you know, just, just cause why not? I think just cause I'm used to it. I'm used to that, like, almost like having to prove to myself that I can do it. Would you say that that's where your addiction to chaos comes in? Probably. Yeah. I mean, I like, I don't love chaos as much as I used to. I think my anxiety has gotten a lot higher over the past year or so. Um, But yeah, I, there's like a certain amount of you know, when you like finish a huge project, you're like, wow, there's like, you feel like you deserve something. And so it's uh, sure. Absolutely. That is where that can come from was like chasing that finished feeling of like, oh, I did it. I can do hard things. I can now take a break or, you know, reward myself in some way. When's the last time that you did a, uh, a shop update with ready to ship pottery that wasn't rainbow stuff? December. Yeah, I do a huge Christmas, huge, huge Christmas thing, which is also easy. Everybody loves Christmas stuff. <laughs> so it's not challenging me in any way. And before that, I had had a like a spring shop update around this time last year. So monthly rainbows and then like biannual releases? I used to do monthly rainbows. I don't do that anymore. I 
every year gives me something a little bit new to play with. Mm-hmm. So the beginning of this year, mm-hmm. I launched like custom word of the year mug. So some people, white women, pick a word of the year Ain't at the beginning of the year. That. No, no, my God, not at all. Uh, but that's who it tends to be. Um, pick a word, you know, to define their year. And they told it to me with some custom colors and I lettered it on there and sent it. Um, I sold like a hundred of those in February, March, January, February, March, and then just like quit them for a bit. Cause also, you know, it's April. Like it doesn't make much sense. People are still asking for it, which I think is interesting. Um, so that was kind of my new thing this year that I focused on for the first quarter Second quarter, I'll do this like spring, you know, early summer shop update. And then honestly, I'll start on Christmas. So I do like snippets of stuff in between there. So like I just had a rainbow mug sale that was on Sunday. So I'll work on that for the next three weeks or so while also doing ready to ship stuff. Like it's a weird dance. And, th- and that's the thing of what I was saying earlier. Like I would love someone in the studio to help me take it to the next level because right now it's just me and I cannot be as consistent as I want to be because there's just simply not enough me, not enough like time, like, you know, people that have an eight hour shift, right. And you can absolutely push back on this and tell me if I'm wrong, but people that have an eight hour shift, they're sitting at their computer, they're whatever, they're in a store, they have downtime and they still get paid. I don't have downtime. Like if I take two hours to go to the gym or two hours to talk to you or two hours to go to the nail salon, that's two hours that I do not get paid. You know what I mean? So I have to make it up in some way. And an eight hour workday of straight painting is so much different than an eight hour workday of like sitting at the desk, at the computer, getting up to the water cooler, like taking a lunch break. Like it, it's just, it's physically demanding, which is, it makes me feel weird to say, because if to anyone looking in, it just looks like I'm sitting here and doing this, but it's like mental, it's physical, it's, and I'm the only one that can do it. Like, I'd love for you to come help me, but you might be shit at this and we don't sell anything. <laughs> Yeah, no, I I hear you. It sounds like the person that you need is is maybe less on the creative execution totally. side, and more on the Absolutely. creative problem solving side. Absolutely, it sounds like you have a a logistical opportunity. Not mm-hmm. like if you're gonna stay and be the creative magic, and you're not gonna bring in other creators up under the umbrella of Amy, y'all, right? At mm-hmm. this time, mm-hmm. sounds like you might need someone on the operations side so that totally. you're your shipping gets more and in, intentional and you have mm-hmm. less stress about it. The, you know, mm-hmm. your packing, your orders, your fulfillment, mm-hmm. billing, et cetera. Um, yeah. I you know anybody? I mean, I have a, a decent network. I can definitely <laughs> put something out, put the bat signal out 100%. Um, yeah. It, it and and like- that's, that's the thing with this. Like people are like, Oh, you're an artist and you need to hire someone. I have an art job. And it's like, you don't have an art job. You have a customer service job. You have a cleaning job. And then like, little sprinkles of art and nobody, not nobody, but you know, not a lot of people want that. I don't want that. My God. For sure. For sure. But you're, you're, I mean, if you want to call it this, I I would say legitimately, like you are, you are legitimately an artist, right? An artist through and through. Yeah. Like that, that's who you are. Right. So, I mean, I could understand why you wouldn't want to come in and do like a (laughs) sprinkle of art and then a lot of other things that are operations. Yeah. Uh, Have you? And I did that for years. That's the thing. Like, I've already done all that alone. I won't do it anymore. Have you thought about creating an apprenticeship? I mean, in what? They don't get paid or they do get paid? Whoa. Whoa. No one said that. Because not to say. Yeah. No, I I get the traditional traditional apprenticeships, right? Or you go and learn, you pay to learn up under somebody. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm more talking about somebody that, like, hey, you know, maybe they want to do, they want to do saying things in the similar vein, or they're recent graduates of with an art degree, or they're in the tattoo world and they want to just understand. Like, a lot of people don't want to just be tacticians, right? They want to yeah. be business owners at the end of the day. I mean, perhaps you need someone that has a more of a less of a background in the art and more of a background in operations and systems and what have you, uh, or is you know, a big nerd coming out of college that knows how to do all of the logistics things that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. I mean, and that's when I say I want someone that cares as much as I do. That's what I mean. I want someone that like is 
in it for something of, for them. You know what I mean? Like, because I, I'm in it for me. I want them to be, to get something out of it as well. And like with my last employee, I was like very upfront about, you can use this space in any way you want outside of work, you know, but it needs, it does need to be separate. Um, like I love those opportunities. Like, because again, that's how I learned everything. I didn't have a person holding my hand being like, this is how you do it. I had access to the space and the supplies and, and learned from there. So yeah, for sure. I, I need someone that is like business minded where we can have like business <laughs> with a sprinkle of art. You know what I mean? Because not everything is like flowers and daisies and paint and cute shit. It's like, where's that tax form that I was supposed to turn in yesterday? <laughs> yeah. Where's the extension? And where does it need to be filed? What, totally. You know, totally. what do I need a reseller's permit? Do I need yeah. this? Do I need that? Like all the stuff yeah. that you don't need to be focusing on if, if you're going to actually grow this thing. Cause right now totally. you are the complete IP 100%. Yeah. And I'm, and I have control issues for sure, but like not in the way that would stop me from growing. Like I want to grow and I'm primed to grow. I just need, I need help basically. Yeah. What does your support system look like of other artists or other higher performing? And when I say higher performing, I do not mean that they know how to traditionally mm -hmm. do what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, economically, <clears throat> fiduciarily, they're ahead of you but you have a, a relationship with them. Like what does your network and support system look like for you? I don't have many like close friends that are in the same boat as me and that are higher. Like they're doing more that could like mentor me in that way. I have more friends that are like, we're in the same boat, like doing the same amount. Mm -hmm. If not like them a little bit more me a little bit more, um, yeah, I can't, I can't think of anybody. I certainly have access to people in that way, but I don't, I just, I think constantly about like, what would I want to happen to me? And like, if someone at this current moment reached out to me and they were like, help me, I would be like, I would love to, I don't have the time. You know what I mean? So I never want to bother anybody in that way, but I certainly have access to people. If there is like a certain question I need answered or like mm -hmm. run something by them. Um, yeah, I would love a like network of people. Like I know plenty of people that like meet up quarterly with, with, you know, other artists and they talk about stuff that's happening, but it's easy for that stuff to get canceled when we get busy, you know? Yeah, no, fair enough. Well, let me flip this around then. You wouldn't want someone coming in with their hand out, right? Like, hey, sure. Amy, help me. But if someone were to come in and be able to <clears throat> offer you a unique uh, a unique benefit in exchange for them to shadow what you were doing, I mean, mm -hmm. what would that be for you? Like, what would the benefit be? Yeah, I mean, I, I would be fine with it, I guess. Yeah, I'd be fine with it. Yeah, Mostly. but specifically, I mean, what what do you think that that somebody coming in would would be able to offer you that you currently desire for leveling up or desire for um, moving forward? Like, what would someone? I want to make sure I have your question correct. What unique benefit would would someone that is under objectively me. under you in the mm -hmm. process be able to bring you? <clears throat> I mean, I think it would give me like a little bit of motivation, right? Like that's what I'm looking for all the time. Um, and like a different, like an outside in, like I'm very close to everything that I'm doing and arguably too close. So I think having someone come in could help me like, you know, zoom out a little bit and look at something in a different way than I'm used to. Beautiful. I love that. Now, if you were to go to someone above you, mm -hmm. what unique benefit would you bring them? Um, coffee. <laughs> no. Um, I don't know, like whatever they wanted, honestly, like it's hard what, for me to answer is, that but, question. I don't know. I, and I hear you. I hear you. But what does Amy bring that somebody else doesn't bring? I don't know. I think you I don't do. Know. I really don't. I really don't. It's a question I, I, can I bullshit like. Something. I like you. But no, do be you. I mean, I, I how, have how a, I have a tremendous skill set. Like I am a great artist. <clears throat> but if I if I'm I have like people in mind, right? That I'm envisioning going to and saying like, let me help you do something. The only thing that I could really teach these people is like lettering. Like that is some, that's a market that I have 
cornered for whatever reason that a lot of like ceramic artists can't do. So I could teach them that, but um, yeah, I don't know. I can't, it's hard for me to think about like what else I'm good at. Again, I'm very close to this. You know what totally, I mean? Like yeah, totally. I don't yeah. zoom out very often. I, I think that you having a network of individuals that are about it the same, like it's, it's a peer group. You have a peer group yeah. of artists around you. Um, for sure. From everyone that's way smarter than I am that I've ever seen, the people that are moving the fastest are people that have the peer group, right? Which is the biggest, largest pool. They have someone that they're mentoring and they have someone mentoring them. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that someone has to say like, oh, I'm better at lettering than you. So I'm going to teach, I'm going to correct you what you're doing on lettering. Not at all, but just objectively further ahead in the journey. Uh, I found that when I've surrounded myself, when I was going through the creative side and, and running a business, doing photo video, same thing. I had someone I was mentoring and had someone that was mentoring me or, or knew more than me was able to, you know, throw some bones every now and again. And mm -hmm. that made me, that allowed me to move way faster than I would have outside of that. Yeah. And in the thing about this, I am now like a little mad at myself because I just wasn't anticipating that question. And I do have like this in particular this weekend, I go to this conference, I'll teach class. I'll see a lot of people that I don't get to see that often. There are, I will leave that situation with exactly what I need. I will be, I will have people that I can ask hiring questions to systems questions to like, but they are not, they are on the business side. They're not on the artist side. You know what I mean? So you asked me in an artist way and that felt different than what I than what I actually have. You know what I mean? Like, I don't necessarily have an artist being like, here's how you could be a better artist, but I do have people being like, here's how you can step your business up. And that is, I mean, what's more valuable? I don't, I don't know. It depends on the day for me. Yeah. I, I would say it really depends. I, I guess that's probably even a better question. You know, the, the person that you may look up to, or you may be able to get nuggets from or learn from might not be on the artist side because mm -hmm. maybe Amy is already the artist that she'll be. Maybe Amy is already progressing mm -hmm. in the artistic mm -hmm. journey that, that she will be without another influence, yeah. right? But maybe on the business side, that's where you need to lean in. Totally. I yeah. hope if nothing else, that when you do go to, to speak this weekend, that you keep it in the back of your head, <laughs> right? Trying to find someone oh, yeah. above and trying to find someone below because I feel as though there's, a, there's some belief things going on with you and mm -hmm. your business currently oh, because you yeah. are this close to it. Yeah. Right? Same way yeah. that I get with, with whether it be podcast or training online in person, what have you, like I am way too close to it. Mm -hmm. And so if someone on the outside is not like, Hey, James, have you, uh, you know, tried to just make a landing page and run traffic ads to it <laughs> with a, a video. And I'm like, everyone famous does that. Why have I not thought about that? Yeah. Oh, duh. Because I'm literally in it day in, day out. And yeah. I'm just absent-minded in that direction. Totally. Yeah. It's, and it's tough and it's tough to also like admit you know, I, I am easier to, I am quicker to tell you all the things I'm doing wrong than I am all the things I'm doing right. And that's not my favorite quality. You know, I, I downplay a lot of success because I don't want to be like, I don't want someone to think I'm wrong or lying or, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's tricky. It's tricky when it's just you and you're nose to the glass and you're answering all the questions and yeah, sometimes it's easier to just kind of like pull away and shut down. And I, I am closer to the shutting down aspect of it. Like, I don't want to talk about business all the time. One, because it's my every fucking day. Like, I don't want to, it's the last thing, like, you know, I think about it. Like I, the, the guy I dated before Elaine, like we had issues and I like never wanted to talk to my friends about it. Cause I thought about it all day long. And so then the, the, relationship lasted so much longer because I didn't ask for processing help or, you know what I mean? Like I've, it almost simple business mistakes happen all the time. Cause I just simply don't want to talk about it. It's like in my head too much. <clears throat> and of course, just to circle back, that's where like the mentor thing comes in. You know, you're right. Yeah. I hate telling men they're right. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Love you slipping that in right there. Yeah, that's um, gonna be the clip you use for Instagram. I can already tell. That's it. That's it. Right. <laughs> put Amy. Put Amy and James on blast. Let's go. Yep. Um, <clears throat> it, yeah, it's interesting though because every every time, and I I find myself in the exact same position. We're just paying ignorance tax because we don't want to speak about it. Mm -hmm. We're just paying more money or more time to do the things that we know that we shouldn't necessarily be doing. Oh. Right. Maybe we don't have a <clears throat> don't have a an answer for it, but we do know that what we're doing right now is 
It ain't it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And days just fly by. Like that's something that the last year has taught me. Like I was last year, I lost a lot of time because I, I have like back issues and Mm -hmm. I was like trying to deal with all of that. And, um, I mean, I truly lost months of work because I was in pain and it's crazy how time can just fly by. And I'm, I'm feel like I'm constantly like grasping time, just being like, I need, I need to rein it back in, like get all that time I lost back stuff. Yeah. How's your back in comparison to how it was? Today? Well, I could, I couldn't get out of bed last year, like for, oh, for a long time. I was like in bed for like a month at a time. I would just throw my back out and couldn't move, couldn't walk, couldn't do anything. And it is a lot better. Like I'm in physical therapy. I, um, like am doing stuff at the gym. That's like very concentrated to not hurt myself. Um, yeah, it, it is a lot better. I mean, I, I hurt all the time, but it's manageable for sure. Is there, is there anything that's helped move you down that path of, of healing more than other things? Yeah. I mean, uh, I do dry needling, which mm-hmm. helps. I hate it. I truly like, I have such a needle, phobia. Like I hate it. Um, that is helping. Like, I think also understanding that my pain is coming from my hips and not necessarily from my back was a huge eye opener for me. So I can like, you know, cater stuff. So, I mean, physical, I'm a huge proponent now of physical therapy. At first I was like, fuck this, this is stupid. And I hate this, Mm -hmm. which is how I am about a lot of things at first. (laughs) And, um, yeah, I, I enjoy that a lot. I also like, I'm obsessed with my gym. My coaches are very in tuned to my body and my needs. And if I were on my own, I would not be able, I would be hurting myself constantly. Where Where are you at gym wise right now? What gym am I at? Yeah. I go to fit Wit in okay. Oakhurst. Where, like where is that? What is that? Who are these people? I've never oh, heard it's of them. the best. Um, there used to be two. There was an old fourth ward and then mm-hmm. this one. So do you know where like U joint is or like anything in the Oakhurst neighborhood? No, it's fine. No, I don't, I don't know. Like I know you don't stay over there. <laughs> no, but I, I mean, I drive through there coming back from Brookhaven. It's like sometimes yeah. when 85 is backed up Brookhaven, mm. like down going through Decatur by Emory. And uh-huh. that this is like East Lake okay. in the area. Okay. Um, but it's like, it's group fitness. It's like focused on conditioning and mobility and strength training. And, um, it's like the classes don't ever get over like 30, I think 30 people is their max or something. They know who you are. Like when I first, my friend started going there and she was like, you should come, you you might like it. Um, and I had this onboarding call and they're telling me all about it. And they're like, you know, we're here to support you. And I was like, Ooh, no. I like, don't call my name. Don't look at me. Like I didn't want that at all. And I like am fully like drinking the Kool-Aid at this point. Like it is what has made me a better person like lately. And like, I, it is, it's so good for my mental health. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like I am not the exercise girl. I'm not out here trying to be like, I'm I'm not stepping on the scale every day. I'm not paying any attention to that. I'm going because like, work is hard and life is hard and I, I need to be there. But anyway, uh, it's the best there. It's like group fitness. I like meet all these people, but it's also tailored to me. So like, there's a workout of the day that happens that goes up on the board. And they ask at the beginning, like, does anybody have any modifications they need? Like do this progression or this progression? Like it is very, it feels very good. Like very community, very, like no one's in there being like, you know, like I don't do well on the coaching standpoint when someone is like tough, like I like a push, but I don't like someone being like, you're like, you'll stay fat forever. If you don't X, Y, Z, like, that's not the kind of like training that I need. Wait, 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 that's... Wait, wait, wait. People say that during, during sessions. I mean, they some have like it, it, you know, some of the like gyms that are, just trying to get your money. You know what I mean? Like they, they're, they're preying on someone like me being like hating myself. And so they're like, if you want to change yourself, you know, you need to do this, this, and this, and you won't have that if you'll continue to do this. You know what I mean? So that's what, that was my like gym history was being around people that like were constantly pinpointing parts of my body and saying that I could change it if I, if only I wanted to, if only I would show up. And now I have 
a group of people that are more interested in like how I feel and like my strength and like cheering me on in that way. And I, I didn't know you could have that basically. It feels good. I like it. Yeah. That sounds, sounds like a great gym. Sounds yeah, like a solid. Community. They're the best. I'm a huge, huge fan. When, uh, when you say that working out or going to the gym is uh, extremely positive for your mental health, like puts you in the, the right position is, is that you showing up there gets you in the right mental health or is it you completing specific things there? Yeah. I, I don't want to go. I mean, sometimes I want to go, but like today I have a huge busy day. Do I want to go to the six fifteen class? Absolutely fucking not. But I know that like, I, if I go home, I will continue to feel tight in a way that I don't want to feel. So I am always chasing the like after of it. The endorphins. If that makes sense. Sure. Yeah. The community yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. Or just like that feeling of like when I get in the car, when I'm done and I'm like, fuck, I did that. And that was hard. And I was able to do it. You know what I mean? Like I am just like we were talking about earlier, completing this big project and feeling like proud of yourself or like, you know, sometimes when I walk into this class, I'm like, there are four things up on that board that are going to be really hard and I might not can do it. And then I'll finish it. And just like that feeling of like, it, I don't know. I like to surprise myself. And so that's kind of what I'm chasing. Okay. So that, that feeling of accomplishment when you, yeah, move, yeah, yeah. You, you feel good. And, and also you came in doubting mm -hmm. and you left achieving. Yeah. And how many gyms did you go to before, before this, that were just not a fit? I did a few, um, like on my own. And I did some where I was like having training at, and they were all like big box gyms. Um, but I, before that I was a runner and I, then I broke my foot and I wasn't able to do that anymore. Um, so it took me, it took me a lot to get back to the gym, like a lot, a lot of like getting past being scared or like yeah, the, worried the about judgment. being. Yeah, I think so. I think like, because you don't ever, I didn't ever want to be the like overweight girl in class who can't keep up. Like that's what scared me about group fitness is because I thought that I was coming into a place, these young hard bodies, like crushing it in different ways. And I, I didn't want to be like looked down on basically. And then I can't, I cannot stress enough that this place is not like that. Like you, I, of course there are people that can like do pull-ups with like weights attached to their waist. And I'm on the ground doing like a, you know, seated pull-up, like, you know, I'm Inverted doing what I can. Row. Yeah. 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 And I'm like, that's totally fine. And, and there, there was a time where that really bothered me and I, it does not bother me at all anymore because I'm not looking at anybody else and they are not looking at me. And if they are looking at me, it's someone being like, that was great. Like, or fix your form here or like, you know, helpful things. Like I, it's yeah. It, it, um, but it, it was very scary at first. Like I, the next month will be my two year anniversary with the gym. And it, it took like almost a full year, probably close to nine months for me to like get in the swing of it all. Right on. Do you, do you find yourself comparing yourself? in there in the gym mm -hmm. mm, no not really like unless like if I if I go to a class where my friend will go to she tends to go to mornings and I go to nights if I show up in one of her morning classes I will like compete with her and I actually don't like that mm. because I am super competitive and it it messes with me I don't I don't want to do that so I try I try not to do that um damn opposite side of the table there uh if samantha's in class with me definitely yeah, competing and i'm sure lower body sending that that woman right out the door right and i'm sure that's like fun for you for you guys and like some weird sex thing is happening there but i can't like i will hurt myself mm -hmm. to to try to win and i i cannot be laid up in the bed again so i think yeah. i have learned to like manage that part of me that makes sense now you don't really compare yourself necessarily except for to your friends who you want to in a very playfully aggressive way want yeah. to beat in the gym. Totally. Um, do you find yourself doing the same level of comparison to other artists? No. Not at all. 
No, because I think I understand there's a difference there. Like just how it's same thing at the gym. Like we're just different Mm -hmm. and your skill set is different than my skill set because I admire, I'm thinking about like people that I want to quote unquote be like, I admire them because they have something I don't have. And I think the, the road is, I think it's going both ways. I think they admire me for something as well. Something character trait wise or skill? Or... Oh, skill. I mean, I'm very charming, very lovable, internationally <laughs> adored. So I'm sure they like that. But um, yeah, skill set wise, because if I'm comparing myself to someone in my own space like that, in an artist way, it is from an artist standpoint. It's not from a business standpoint. It's not from anything. Like I'm looking to see if like I could do what they're doing. And if I can't, that doesn't bother me. It ta- It takes a lot of people to make the world go around. Yeah. It takes a village to get things done. I know that that's a, um, that's a phrase that's used when it's talking about raising children, but I think it also can be applied to to teams can be applied to business can be applied to a lot of things. Um, and I seem to take it more that direction because no kids, no Mm -hmm. kids here today. Mm -hmm. Uh, Um, uh, I want to circle back to, to the it's P Y O P Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. paint your own pottery. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, so when is when is Amy y'all going to trademark and license out all of the systems that she built working under someone else nationally or internationally? They will probably sue me if I do that particular Beautiful. thing. Um, you know an attorney. <laughs> that's true. I um so a lot of my I do a lot of teaching. I do a lot of I do a lot of art teaching. I do a lot of business teaching Mm -hmm. and a lot of like marketing teaching and things like that. So I'm not necessarily at a space right now where I am like selling the like physical things. Mm -hmm. Like I'm more so just showing up and teaching. I teach at about four or five conferences a year. Um, But yeah, I, you know, I have my own bisque line. So I design like I'm like I just showed you, I designed the shapes. They get mass manufactured and then people all over the country buy them and stock them in their shops. So people could everywhere can paint my designs. And um I get a fat royalty check every month and it rules and like that's a you know great part of my income. Um so yeah, there's certainly there's a space where I want that to happen. But again, right now I feel so smushed to the glass of everything that I I want more always, but I can only do so much always. Like it it used to be, you know, 2020, a lot of 2021, I didn't feed myself. I didn't go to the gym. I didn't go to the doctor. I didn't do anything because my entire day was work and I got so much done and I made so much money and it was awesome. And I can't, I don't, I don't want to do that anymore. You know what I mean? So it's, it's weird to like prioritize like myself over the business and potentially be making less money and less moves because I've prioritized what I want to do. You know, like I could get a head start on writing these systems, right? Hypothetical systems to sell if I skip the gym this week, because that that would give me back like, you know, roughly six hours. I don't want to do that. I'd rather go to the gym. I think that's fair. And I think that you're you're operating in a way that I would see is more aligned with uh, you doing this for a long time, and yeah. Not just for the next that's year. That's the or two. goal. Totally, right. totally. Not to to have a because you don't keep yourself in a place where you're you're striving to be more conditioned and and to be stronger. Like you end up slipping and falling, and then you can't even work for mm-hmm. six to eight months. Like that's not a position that I think is worth the mm-hmm. speed up of of writing systems at all. So I'd say that you're probably from my point of view, solidly aligned to not do that. Um, yeah. But if I had the right person, of course mm-hmm. I could do it all. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I, I, ha- I can't stress you enough. Like it's almost time to hire someone and, and, and take us a, a step up. Yeah. That makes sense. That definitely makes sense. Talk to me about the, uh, the good for y'all membership. That's something else I, I saw on your website to. that I, uh, I didn't find. Don't too understand. Nope. Yeah. But, but it, it's, Yeah. Out of the industry, it's so complicated to understand. So it is the same thing as if you were to buy a subscription service to a trainer that every month sent you a packet of workouts. So what I'm doing is every month, I actually retired it at the end of last year, but I'm bringing it back because so many people demanded it. Um, 
what I'm doing is every month I'm writing a project, painting it, photographing it, like making a template, making like a stencil, everything and delivering it to studio owners so that they can make a class. So something really big in the paint your own pottery industry are classes and workshops. And a lot of people like us don't have a lot of time to plan things like that because they're working in the business and not on the business. So what I'm doing is I'm supplying them with one project a month where they, they can set it up. They can immediately list it on their website as this is the platter that we're painting this month. It's mother's day themed, like grab all your girls and come in and paint this project. Um, but I've designed it. So it's like specialty designed. It's all done for you. They don't have to do anything, but literally print the project out and the the templates and things like that. And they can sell it immediately, you know, for like 40 bucks a person. So it's, it's, it's good. It's very good. I, I ran it for three years and needed a break. I was burnt out on it. Um, but like I said, I, so many people want it. So I'm going to bring it back in May, actually. That's why it's still on the website. <laughs> it's yeah. like shuttered for a second, but I, I don't know what you're out here talking about. You don't have systems. You don't have things built out, Amy. You're doing exactly what I'm talking about. Package differently. <laughs> yeah. Very, very funny. You're doing a done for you package system to push forward the industry so that these totally. shop owners have another opportunity to sell, to create community, to bring people totally. around something that y'all all love, but mm -hmm. you're also then prov providing them the, the done for you so that they can reach more people. And then you're associated with everyone else that they reach because yeah. they're using your products to do it, your templates to do it, <laughs> yeah. and coming back to your, your brain that created it. Yeah, no, it's good. But you know, I've been doing this for a long time, like, you know, day in, day out for three years, like four will be this year it's hard to remember all the stuff that I've done just like it's hard to like yeah a thousand rainbow mugs in three and a half years that's a lot of fucking rainbow mugs and I forget that a lot like especially in times where I'm feeling like overwhelmed or you know feeling like I'll never be able to like get something out of the studio like because I'm so wrapped up in like having to, you know, write a class for this conference or having to meet with someone about, you know, a, for my BISC line or things like that. It, it I, I need to like write a thousand mugs somewhere up on my walls so that I can remember that like I have put in a lot of work already and that I can still continue to do it. I just need to kind of pull back a little bit. It sounds like you're missing gratitude points for yourself on the. Seems like it. On the journey. Seems like it. Because for as many times as you've said on this podcast that you haven't done this or you haven't done that, <laughs> I, keep, I keep finding things that you've done that you forgot that you did. That's true. That's fair. It's just me in here all day long. I don't, I listen to so many podcasts. I don't talk to anybody. Like it's easy to forget what's happening. Do you not talk to anybody or do you just not talk to them in any other way, but through your work? Um, I mean, I literally don't open my mouth sometimes. I'll, I have close friends that I'll run something by if I need to, but they're also like running major companies and, you know, it's hard to like ask someone to take a break to like hear me talk yeah. out something really quickly. It's like tactical advice from people that are operating at a, at a pretty high level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That, that makes sense. Your, your core values listed on your website are creativity, inclusivity, mm -hmm. expression, mm -hmm. encouragement, and passion. There it is. How did you land on those? Because I accessed and like went through everything that I've just been doing the past few years. So like I love teaching. I love showing people that they can do something that they don't know how to do. I think all art, most of art can be taught. And I think with enough practice, you can master it. Um, obviously, inclusivity is a huge deal for me. Like I am a queer person. I want to be in a space where someone if they don't come, I mean, I don't think anyone should completely agree with you all the time, but I want to feel like safe somewhere, you know, obviously creativity is a huge thing. What am I missing? What else, what else did you just say? It's been a while since I looked at those. Creative, inclusivity, uh -huh. expression, uh -huh. encouragement, and passion. Yeah. I mean, passion, like what a, that's, that's the whole reason why we're doing all this shit, right? Yeah. For art like and it, education, the ability yeah. to share it with you all is what truly keeps me going it's true and i mean sharing is like a huge part of of what i am about like in terms of like information i love to share information but i also want to like like i i preach this to so many people in the internet space like 
context matters across the board. Like even you and I had a conversation recently about the way you phrase something and I took it in a different way than you meant it. And you were able to provide me context and it made sense for what you're doing. Like, I think that kind of sharing and that kind of understanding is so valuable. And I, I strive to do that as much as I can. Obviously I, I do get it wrong sometimes, but yeah, sharing can mean a lot of different things for me, I think. Yeah, I think that's definitely fair. I, I want to circle back to inclusivity. Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned a few things that are, I, I believe that you would identify with um, and, and where you want to provide an inclusive space. Uh, but what is, I mean, overall, your brand, your um, your light in the world, what you're providing, the service, the product, who are you being inclusive of? Honestly, as, as many people as I can, I do feel like this is a trick question. <laughs> um no, I want like, I want all people like who are open to me. I want them to feel safe. Like, obviously I don't want like someone that doesn't believe what I'm about, like fundamentally, you know what I mean? Like, I don't necessarily want to build out a space where they feel like they can spew whatever they want, but I also want to give them a shot if they need to. Like, I think, I feel like a lot of I'm thinking in terms of like when Trump happened, that was a huge issue for my family and me. And I was able to hear someone out only if they were able to hear me out. And there were a lot of times where that it didn't feel like we could have a conversation with each other. So that for me, like an inclusive environment does mean like you tell me about you and I'll tell you about me and we'll deal with it. And I think everyone, you know, needs a space like that. Like, I don't always just want to be in like an echo chamber of like, we're all screaming the same thing at each other. And like a lot of times Instagram can feel that way. Um, I've certainly gotten off the tangent of your question, but I inclusivity, the people I want to be inclusive about are people that need me and need what I'm about and need to hear that a queer person from the South can be happy and start their own business and can work hard and, and be there and, and get it done basically. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that that's not the answer that I was expecting for you to give, but I appreciate you going. (laughs) for sure. I mean, because I feel like the stock answer is also still accurate. Like I want, if the intention is there. Sure. Like I want, like, however you identify is fine with me as long as you're not a fucking asshole. Yeah. You know? And even if you're an yeah. asshole, like we can, we can figure it out. We can give just you a make shot. sure you're nice. Yeah. Just make sure you're nice. Yeah. And, and I, I asked that not, not to try to catch you some different direction, but I think that, I think that there are people that say inclusivity and there are people that, that preach it in brand values or people that um, speak about it online, speak about it in person and truly mean it. And I think there's been a lot of brands and a lot of people that mm-hmm. use the terminology and put their pronouns in their, their bio on Instagram or in their email to virtue signal. Mm-hmm. And I don't get the impression that you're part of that second group by any stretch, but I did want to give you space to communicate <laughs> about that because yeah. I think that it's a lot of things are the cool thing to say and cool thing yes. to do. I agree. And, and they don't have any, they don't have any negative downstream effects for the person that's saying them, that's using them to yes. be signaling. Um, so I think it's important to, to get an accurate definition for you and not for anybody else, not for Merriam Webster or anything else, but totally have an understanding of what you mean. By that. <clears throat> and I, and I think it's like, and I certainly don't ever want to be that type of person. And I feel, I try to be very careful about that because I, you can always tell like I, this literally earlier this week, I was watching a couple of Taylor Swift videos and I love her. I'm like a new late in life Swifty, but lately the last like leading men are uh, not white and it feels like a move. It feels strategic. It feels like I noticed it and it didn't, and that felt weird. And I think people can, when they mean it, you don't notice it. If that makes sense. Like it almost, when they mean it, it doesn't feel like it's just it, natural. You don't, get a, you don't get an ick. You don't get a feeling. Yeah. It, yeah. It's like, yeah, that feels right. And like, and of course, I mean, Taylor Swift is a very big example. Like, you know, she's like larger than life. So it's what even does feel right for her. Who knows? But yeah, there are, I think there are people that can 
do that and, and, um, mean it and walk the walk. And there are people that, like you said, are just doing it because they feel like it's the thing to do right now. Fair enough. I appreciate you, uh, you opening up there. Where do you think on, on in- inclusivity, where, where do you think that, that art or art education or, um, the, the indie art market could do a better job of including more people that might be interested in, in art, creating, buying, purchasing, but feel a little bit of shame or a little weird that they, they have these, these things that aren't accepted for their dogma or their identity mm-hmm. or what have you. I mean, I think that's where the internet comes into play. Like you can always find your people on the internet and it can be hard and it can be weird and it can feel like you're screaming into the void for a little bit, but mm-hmm. um, there is, I, I feel like very few people can like alienate <laughs> others always. You know what I mean? Like there, uh, there are plenty of artists that like I admire that I wouldn't hang their stuff in my house, mm-hmm. but they're crushing it. You know what I mean? Like, so in, in a physical space, like in an art market, I think it's just taking more chances on people. And and I do see that happening. Like I've been in plenty of art markets over the past couple of years where it feels like, you know, there's a variety of mediums, there's a variety of people. It feels like more authentic than just having like, you know, the same looking people doing the same looking stuff forever and ever. But yeah, I mean, it's like taking a chance on someone for sure. And I'm sure if bigger brands would do it, you know, like Starbucks Mm -hmm. for a long time and they still do, they have a program where they'll like find indie artists to design cups and things like that. And that's huge. Like that can, I've seen them, you know, work with people who have like 600 Instagram followers and like break them off with a deal and that can be life-changing and, you know, it's about taking a risk and trying. Yeah. So the same thing could be applied for anyone that's, that's wanting to get into art, that's wanting to find their, their, uh, their voice, wanting to, mm-hmm. to try, um, you'd recommend that they jump in the same way that sometimes brands enterprise level should take a risk on somebody that they can't prove will get ROI. Yeah. I mean, I think if you, especially if you're just starting out, like you just have to do it. Like no one knows that what you're doing, unless you're telling them what you're doing, you know, like you just got to put it out there and, and see what happens and you're going to get it really wrong for a long time. And then you're like, I, I forget who says this, but like people that are overnight sensations are 10 years in the making. Like that feels very real to me. Mm -hmm. Um, so things take time and you get it wrong and, you know, go from there. Yeah. It's, it's also like a lot of, I think imposter syndrome comes in when we look at other people and we're like, well, they're popping you know, they sold a thousand mugs. Mm -hmm. If I do the math, that's a ridiculous amount of money. I've never Mm -hmm. made that much money doing art. Um, I don't know if I can do that. Mm -hmm. But what they fail to understand is that you spent, you know, 10 years, a decade working under somebody else and building their IP from top Mm -hmm. to bottom. And then only got into selling even when you left there half a year, eight months, Mm -hmm. nine months later, sold the first thing. And then started going from there. Like that, <laughs> there's a journey there. Yeah. Yeah. There is a journey there. You, you say in your, in your Instagram bio that you're a queer icon uh-uh. Uh-huh. in my mind, uh-huh. right? In, in parentheses. Uh-huh. What does a queer icon mean to you? It means someone that's an icon that happens to be queer. You know what I mean? Like RuPaul, it's queer icon, you know, love them, hate them, it's queer icon um and I feel the same way like I being queer is such a big a part of me mm-hmm. um and it follows me everywhere I go and I like that like I I enjoy it okay very straightforward answer for yeah. sure uh and reading at a bar do you do a lot of a lot of yeah. reading at bars yeah fiction like my whole thing um I prefer fiction um, but we'll do nonfiction, but mostly in audio. That's how I like to ingest my nonfiction. Nonfiction and like using Audible or Goodreads mm-hmm. or something. Mm-hmm. Audible, yeah. Audible and uh, and then tactile, touching paperbacks for fiction. If I'm if I'm at the bar, we got low light to deal with, so I have my Kindle out. Wow. So okay. if Amazon's listening, like I'm poster child, like I, it's fine. <laughs> I don't care about your other practices. If you just want to like break me off with a deal, 
Um, yeah, I love my Kindle. Um, I do a lot of reading on my Kindle, but yeah, I like, um, like paperbacks and hardbacks and stuff like that. It's just harder to carry around. Yeah, absolutely. What's your, um, if you, if you had to give one book recommendation for anyone that's coming up as an artist, anyone Mm -hmm. that wants to be an artist, anyone that's looking to go down that path, uh, what book would you recommend? See, that's tough. Cause I don't, I don't really like reading is my escape, right? Reading is Mm -hmm. not my, um, business Mm -hmm. area. So the last like artistic business book I read, my God, it's been forever. I couldn't even tell you. I truly couldn't even tell you. Mm. I'll get back to you. Okay. Let me think it through. I'll I'll be waiting. DMs and uh, and my texts. It's interesting. I'm not even in the art world, but Mm -hmm. something that I think resonated with me very early on when it came out was Mark Manson's um, Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. Yeah. And then also The War war of Art. I haven't read that one. So not Lao Tzu's... (laughs) you know, uh, art mm-hmm. of war, the opposite. I forget, maybe it's Pressfield. I don't know if that's right, but I'm gonna have to look uh, it up. we'll find it. It is a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, and when I dabbled and well, when I did photo video, I read it. Um, and then when I dabbled in just a little bit of music production in 2020, I just mm. fucked around, found out, made some things. They're out on Spotify. They're out everywhere actually. Um, and it Incredible. was very, it was very interesting. It, it was fun. It was fun. It was yeah. like me being a, getting a candy shop, right? Making stuff, not knowing what the heck I was doing with the DAW or a MIDI mm-hmm. pad, but just mm-hmm. trying to get out there and do it. So, uh, it's yeah. funny that that's where you go to. Like I, if I want to, when I'm reading something, I I'm avoiding nonfiction in that way because everything starts to feel like a to-do list. Like, I love the artist Lisa Congdon. She and she writes books, and she's probably the book I would recommend. But it starts to take the enjoyment out of it because I'm thinking oh, I need to be doing that or I need to be doing that, and it like then becomes another work thing. So it's like if I if this is gonna be a work thing, that I need to be reading this during work hours. Like when I'm out at the bar with my girlfriend, like having some beers and eating some fries or something. Like I'm in it for escape and escape only. Yeah, that's super fascinating. I think that you're in line with a lot of people that that use books like that. Mm-hmm. I don't use books like that. I that doesn't I'm surprise the, me at all. I've seen your bookshelf. I'm also the the two and a half x speed guy on Audible in my ears yeah. to just crank. Like, oh, I got steps. I got seven thousand yeah. steps. I got to do. Need to listen to half a book on the way. You know. Oh yeah, I mean, I'm I'm at like one point eight at least. Like, I'm not. If you're listening to it at one, I don't know what's happening with you. I don't know if you do the same thing when you're when you're um when you're glazing and like with, with podcasts and whatnot, but I cannot listen to at one speed. It feels so slow. It feels like we're just even with a podcast, like with yes. a chatty podcast, if I speed it up too much, like they get nah, 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 and I can't understand them, but like with a book for sure, I can't, I have to speed yeah, it up. Definitely hear you there. I mean, I listen to, um, I listen to modern wisdom by Chris Williams, Williams, <clears throat> who knows? Um, and then a few <laughs> other, <laughs> a few other, um, I guess you could say they're, they're self-development, but not really self-development. They're more mm-hmm. like business centric, but I, I can listen to those, those people at like two X two two and a half X, but not a, like if it was, here's a random example. Like if I was listening to something like call her daddy, I'm mm-hmm. not listening to that at two X speed because I right. can't understand. There's no nuance. Exactly. There's no buildup. Exactly. There's no nothing there. Right. We're yeah. going back closer to regular speed. Right. But if we're talking about like tactical implementation of stuff, I have like a question for faster, you. What do you do for fun? Um, and when do you this do is it? Part of it. This is part of what I do for fun. This is work, but okay, this, keep going. Well, this technically doesn't have any monetary utility. Still work, not, not in the way that I do it. Still work. I I don't view it as work. Well, okay. So what else do you do? Lift weights. Okay. Hike. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Go on. That's great. I'm loving that. Give me a non-fitness related thing that you do for fun make music okay that's great okay read some books mm-hmm. but they all seem to be like business they're forward yeah they're, they're okay, not fiction work, um, i don't really okay. read i don't really read fiction um that's spend fun. time with the homies mm-hmm. um yeah nature i do a, a decent amount and sometimes i you know i stack community time with with mm-hmm. friends of mine with 
outdoor activities like hiking. And then sometimes I also combine that with, you know, carrying some weight or packing out and packing in Mm -hmm. kind of thing. So it's kind of twofer, but it's not interesting. The, I mean, when time is spent like that, it's not like, Hey, I have a weight vest on, or I have my rucksack on and we're trying to go, unless we're intentionally trying to go for gold, we're Mm -hmm. not really pushing hard. It's more so just to get a a double stimuli there Uh with people that also are into the same kind of thing. Okay. Like if I'm not in a position where I'm wearing a rucksack or a vest when we're hiking, like I'm usually the odd man out. So what I'm hearing is you don't often give yourself a break. I give myself tons of breaks. Like in tons. what way? Very small breaks, completely disconnected from here. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Optical and uh, an auditory flow walking. I do a whole lot of walking, probably more than most people do. Okay. And I also journal, you know, I do that's great. Things. That's great. Uh, as far as like what society would say is like, hey, we're going to go check out and go get beers and go do this and that. Like, mm-hmm. I don't do a ton of that stuff. And a lot uh-huh. of that is not because I think there's there's anything wrong with it. A lot of it is because that's all I used to do. Used to do uh-huh. no pursuits of anything outside of work and that type of thing when I was in the restaurant industry. And I was there mm-hmm. for about a decade. And so all I did was work, bartend, mm-hmm. the bottles behind the bar, pour drinks, right? Say sometimes obscene things behind the bar have fun there but then my social circle was doing the same thing just on the other side of the bar Mm. and because it was so much of that for so many years packed in like five to seven nights a week every single week um that's what i did through the whole time in college and then a year after and then when i moved back to atlanta same thing um because i did so much of that like it doesn't for lack of better phrasing it doesn't arouse a spirit like for me to go Mm -hmm kick it at the bar and and get beers or go watch a game or what have you. Yeah. You got it out of your system is what I'm hearing. Yeah. I just did too much of it for like too much of a density of it for too many years in a row that like someone's like, Hey, you want to go grab, grab drinks? I'm like, maybe at Muchacho where I can eat food, Mm -hmm. but I'm not trying to be there for eight hours. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm certainly not starting to either. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna think about that for a while. Any other questions? No. No other questions. Well, I want to respect your time and I greatly appreciate more than you know, of course. Um, you making time for this. And um, I, I've had a good time. We've been in here like almost, mm-hmm. almost, uh, I mean, it's 2.50. We started like just after one. So, I mean, we're looking at like almost two hours. I know. God, not even my mom's going to listen to this. She doesn't want to hear me talk that long. No, I'm kidding. Everyone's going to listen to it. <laughs> Many people don't like to listen to the podcast. They're like, James, I'm glad you're doing that. Yeah, not listening to that whole not thing. Listening. That's, that's yeah. too long. I mean, um, I'll listen to it. I love right. hearing myself talk. I do. I do too. So I'm not, I'm not <laughs> against it. You know, it is what it is. Um, I want to to open up the, the last thing here for you to, to kind of, one, give the people where they can find you what you have Mm -hmm. coming up, how they can get in touch with you, how they can connect with you to provide you value to help you scale that business. If someone feels (laughs) like that's maybe a position that they could be in. Yeah. Uh, And then, and then we'll, we'll take, we'll take care of the secondary thing in just a second. Go ahead. Yeah. You can find me. I'm mainly just on Instagram. So you can find me at, at Amy Yall, A-M-M-I-E-Y-A-L-L. And you can find my email there if you want to try to work with me. And um, yeah, I'm always, I'm always, not too far from Instagram. So you can certainly find me there. Okay. Um, I'll link all this stuff that that's connected to you in the show notes. So it'll be on everything, YouTube, uh, to streaming and what have you. Last thing though, that I want to, I want to leave people with is if anyone's listening to this and feels like they're in maybe the position that, that you were in when you're going through the BFA or Mm -hmm. when you were at the, the, the shop that had multiple places where you were kind of, I don't want to say in, in a position where you were basically in servitude, but Mm-hmm. Essentially, I was you're in a place where undervalued like, and overworked. Absolutely. So, someone in that position, on the front end of their of their artist journey, or in school, like trying to figure out how the heck they're going to take a BFA and apply it. Like, mm-hmm. what what kind of advice would you give those people? You know, I would say try to try to make the most of it, and like, if you can't get a job in your exact field try to get as close to it as you can. I mean, I left school with this art degree and I happen to have an art based job and that helped me carve out where I am now. Um, but I also like, wouldn't freak out if you have graduated and feel like you don't know what's next. Um, just maybe keep 
track of your time. Like if you do need to take a break, if you've got this BFA or, you know, got this degree in your hand and you can't make it work for you, go off and, you know, obviously make money because we have to, but like pay attention to how much time is happening. Cause you lost a decade in the restaurant restaurant industry. I lost a decade working for a company that didn't work for me. Um, and I feel like we could have, you know, if we were paying a little bit closer attention, we could have maybe cut that in half and met some goals a lot earlier. Yeah. And I but also I'm in my early thirties and I'm just figuring it out, you know, and it will continue to figure it out. And I used to be really caught up on being 30 and thought I was going to have all these different things. And I just let that go and that's okay. So you always have time. That's my, my biggest thing that I have to remind myself of. We have time. You can pivot. You're looking at two people that have did 10 years in, in different things and they're doing now. And, and then also you need to be mindful and present enough that you don't let the time pass you so that maybe mm -hmm. you can shorten our 10 years to five or five totally. to two and a half or two and a half totally. to one. Um, and be on the path of where you're trying to go sooner. Yeah, that's it. Beautiful. I'm going to cut the recording <laughs> there, uh, but don't go anywhere yet.